avete ragione, noi siamo essenziali, perché se ci fermiamo noi, si ferma il mondo. Welcome to Contrasense, a podcast exploring current issues and new research from the social sciences. This episode is part of our series on social movements and activism, called Mishkar in Contrasense, which roughly translated is like movements against or movements in the opposite direction. I'm Maria Martelli and I'll be discussing with three activists and organizers about women's struggles, migrant struggles, transnational organizing and the EAST, Essential Autonomous Struggles Transnational, network. EAST, as the acronym suggests, has Eastern and Central Europe as its main focus, but looks at this specific space as part of a transnational field of struggle. The network wants to unite new struggles and strikes against exploitation, male violence and institutional racism by connecting already existing struggles. In conversation with me, there's Eleonora Orchide and Sopo. Eleonora Capuccilli is part of Transnational Social Strike Platform, TSS, which fosters and connects the strikes and struggles of industrial logistic workers, women migrants, and she is also part of Precarious Disconnections, an Italian collective made of men and women, migrants and Italians focusing on precarity as the global and comprehensive condition of contemporary labor. The TSS platform, together with Lev Femme, initiated the process that led to the creation of a social autonomous struggle transnational. Orchide Eschi, she is also part of East and Precarious Disconnection. She is originally from Turkey and now she is a migrant woman and activist in Italy and part of Women's Assembly of Migrant Coordination of Bologna, which fights every day against patriarchal violence, neoliberal exploitation and institutional racism, and also she's part of Transnational Migrant Coordination. And there's also Sopo Japarice, she is also part of East and TSS, and is a chairperson in an independent union called the Solidarity Network in Georgia. Hello everyone, hello Eleonora, Sopo and Orchide. It's so nice to have you uh, and I've been uh, following a little bit of your work which is so so interesting with EAST. So my first question is basically what what is EAST? Sure, I can start by saying a few words. Hi everybody. Um, so EAST is a network of women, migrants, LGBTQI people, workers, um, from collectives, unions, organizations from Central and Eastern Europe, but also from Turkey, Georgia, and also beyond. Um, so it was born in the first months of the pandemic when um, together the Transnational Social Strike Platform and the Bulgarian feminist collective Le Femme opened a communication with other activists, with other women, migrants, LGBTQI people from the region, but also beyond. Uh, we started it uh, because we saw basically two things. On the one hand, we saw um, an increase in the, in the workloads for essential workers. Therefore, it's also in the name of, of, the, plat- or of the network. And especially increase uh, in, the, in the labor um, for women with the double shift of productive and reproductive labor but in general, longer shifts and more intense uh, exploitation, but also an an increase of domestic violence, more institutional racism uh, against migrants, Roma people, refugees. Uh, But on the other hand, we also saw the multiplication of struggles and strikes involving these essential workers. So we saw the strikes of the nurses, uh, the doctors, the cleaners, care workers, social workers, but also migrants working in the logistics warehouses, factories in the fields. Uh, Therefore, we wanted to put these struggles in communication and foster new ones. Um, So therefore, I would say that East uh, started from the need to communicate and organize transnationally in social reproduction as a field of conflict. Uh, So already starting from the perspective of the struggles, Um, looking and drawing on uh, what we have seen with the global feminist movement in the last few e- few years. Uh, one of the tenets of, of this is that patriarchal violence, neoliberalism, exploitation, and institutional racism are global, and our response should be global as well. And uh, finally, I wanted to add that um, the, the pandemic 
uh, demonstrated that the whole Europe heavily depends on the labor of Eastern migrant workers and the entire project of uh, the European Union is based on the government of uh, the movements of mobility of labor from uh, within its territory and also outside its borders. Uh, therefore, East is a transnational network because we want to bridge the divide between East and West uh, when we imagine a powerful transnational initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Eleonora. That is so interesting and it's so powerful because I think sometimes uh, we tend to think maybe in, in national terms uh, for struggles and not in transnational terms, where, where clearly um, capitalism exploits everybody regardless of national borders. Um, and uh, I just I just really start to see there's a lot of power in this sort of transnational organizing, but it also sounds really difficult to do. So maybe you can just expand a bit on what what you're doing and how you're doing it. Okay, I will say a few things and maybe Sopo can add or... Yeah, yeah, Continue, start and then we could... Okay. Um, so basically we started with some... Um, Firstly, some closed meetings and then uh, with public webinars and, and then we enlarged the, our audience, let's say, with uh, some public assemblies. Um, the, the assemblies were very powerful moments, uh, as you also said before, Maria, uh, where we could uh, face uh, all the challenges that the pandemic posed to political initiative because, you know, the restrictions uh, to our occupation of the public space. So it was a moment where we could uh, think and strategize together uh, about how our uh, common struggle or how actually to build a common struggle against uh, racism, exploitation, uh, and also patriarchal violence, which was, which was uh, one of the first things we saw uh, that increased during the, the pandemic. Uh, after these uh, public assemblies uh, were, uh, let's say, a, a more uh, a coordination group um, started to work together on a more tight schedule, let's say. Um, we wanted to have also some um, statements and some days to mobilize in order to show that we were actually building a transnational force and to gather more people to our project of uh, connecting East and West, <laughs> let's say, to simplify. So we um, launched this uh, Essential Strike Manifesto for the 8th of March, which was um, probably uh, one of the, the most forceful demonstrations that the project of this was important, uh, actually because it was the uh, what happened to the essential workers, uh, the, cor the special uh, corridors and, and flights to move workers from one country to another, what was happening to uh, with the strikes of uh, uh, logistics workers, workers etc., uh, so we connected all these things to the problem of uh, how to expand the struggles of women and migrants. And, uh, and we wanted to use the 8th of March as a moment when to say our life is essential, even though we have been uh, called uh, essential just to be exploited and more expendable workers. Uh, but also our struggle is essential and our strike is essential. And we want to organize it on a transnational level. So we took the 8th of March as a moment to organize. Um, and after that, so we also had some national assemblies uh, where we could present the Central Strike Manifesto. Um, and then we continued with, with other public assemblies. And the last uh, thing we did was uh, a statement on uh, uh, the Istanbul Convention um, that, that is under attack, but maybe we will say a few things later. And finally, last thing I wanted to mention is uh, on the on the first of May, uh, we join the uh, East joins the calls for um, transnational migrants uh, struggle and strike uh, launched by the transnational migrants coordination. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot of things. <laughs> Uh, congratulations, first on all, all of this organizing. And um, secondly, yes, maybe Sopo could expand a bit on uh, how do these transnational strikes actually work? Because, um, well, what I have in mind is 
more like smaller strikes that I'm more familiar with, strikes that involve workers in one particular place where they can put pressure on their particular employer. And obviously, I imagine this to be quite different. Uh, yeah, in general, transnational social strikes are can have two purposes. One can actually be for immediate goals, like within what we know is like limited to an employer, but could have a transnational nature like the Amazon strikes. So like Amazon is almost everywhere now. So you can like coordinate transnationally, even though it's against employer and have, you could have like different grievances, but they often are about the same across the world. And then there's also like the, the part about the social part, right? Social strike is that you could have a strike that they can be more, you know, symbolic, or it could also be like actually accomplish the function of the strike, which where you withdraw your labor, either that could be in social reproduction sphere or that could be at your workplace. And then it's more about connecting and even having, and I don't want to say like consciousness raising, but in a lot of ways it affects the people way they think about things. So all the things that Eleanor just described, um, giving it a, a face, a militancy behind it, instead of just uh, what I think mostly what happens with these things is just like people just get together and, and, and do studies and discuss forever and ever and ever. And I never really give it, um, force behind it, let's say. And so having a, a strike uh, action, um, people have put practice behind um, this idea. It doesn't, it's not left up into only these like sort of very relegated gender studies or something like that, you know, the academic sphere like, often is. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I think that's particularly important because of uh, this, this migrant uh, work uh, the migrant workforce is so strong and so big and obviously if it would organize for striking the the blow would be um pretty huge i imagine i think the only way we could actually make concessions um in a small way and larger way so concessions immediate concessions like wage hikes to larger concessions like completely you know social reproduction not not being not falling on women and migrants right um, is to do it together. And I think that's the, what needs to be done, but often we get very like caught in our own everyday little routines against the employer, against local problems where we fail to really see that most of them have international origins of like, you know, the transnational companies or are being sold on a stock market or our own people say from Georgians are, easy you know cheap labor force say in europe so they can keep the wages down and so almost always there's a transnational dy dynamic that's happening to exploitation we just don't know it or we're just not really sp uh, spending enough time to really unpack it um and so we think it's a local problem often and i love that we try very hard even though we're I think like this is has been for me an amazing process because it has un, sort of unearthed all these like amazing women, mostly women who've been doing amazing work, um, not only organizing, but also writing and thinking about this and been connecting them all. Um, and I think like this is a huge beginning to then uh, strengthen it, transnational consciousness in our own countries. Yes, I, I, I just... I really, I, I find uh, I find so much energy in just listening to you because I I sometimes find the news to be so bleak and the situation, the general situation, to be so uh, sometimes despairing, sometimes terrifying. That, like you said, it's really hard to to find the the energy and the force to come together and to do all the work that that needs to be done, so people can actually come together and organize together. So, so it's really it's really great to listen to these stories and to to focus on how how we can do do this all of these things and not only fight back but even um, you know do the work of doing things differently not just re also resistance but not just resistance just creating something else and that's that's one amazing thing and it's really difficult to do when there is so much to to fight back.
uh, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking of what uh, we were mentioning the Istanbul Convention and the fact that Turkey um, was retreating from the Istanbul Convention and there's all this conservative backlash in Poland too. And uh, that's something that really needs people to organize against, against, against this, these kinds of movements. I was thinking maybe Orkida, you could tell us a bit about it. Um, yes, I, I think the transnational um, level and just the point, the transnational point, as also Sopo and Eleonora uh, was talking about, is very important and um, at the base also on the attacks against the uh, Istanbul Convention. Um, in these days, uh, we're talking about Turkey's withdrawal from Istanbul Convention. However, we know that actually in the whole of Eastern and Central Europe, the convention has been under attack since late 2017 and has not been ratified in countries like Bulgaria, Slovakia, Hungary, um, and also Poland now is trying to um, organize a, a new, uh, let's say, convention to um, to propose it to these uh, countries. Um, we know that um, actually in the in the countries where on the paper Istanbul Convention is um, exists. For example, um, I, I, I talk from Italy, and in Italy it exists on the paper, but um, we know that um, Istanbul Convention, it's not enough alone to avoid um, patriarchal violence, male violence against women. So even if um, the Istanbul Convention um, exists on the paper in some countries, in everywhere in the world, there is a still huge problem on the uh, freedom and um, in the sense that the male violence against women. So actually, even if in the places where the Istanbul uh, Convention is not um, visibly under attack, we, we know that we need to um, organize ourselves as a feminist um, um, transnational fight. And actually, East uh, is trying to do this. East uh, uh, is a really important platform uh, in order to bring together all the um, women and feminist women's uh, moments all over the world, but especially on the this um, Central and Eastern um, European in countries so uh, this uh, since the attacks on uh, Istanbul convention as the uh, against women's freedom is is not a single isolated event but it is a transnational event we need to also respond transnationally because um, the Erdogan's uh, withdrawal from Istanbul Convention was actually a message to uh, all women in the world that um, the family, the, the traditional family, uh, should be at the center of the um, society's uh, organization. Also because this brings us, again, to the uh, organization of um, social reproduction. Because we know that, um, as also my comrades said before, um, the social reproduction is carried out mostly by women and by migrant women in all the in all the um, in all these countries. So that's why uh, for these um, conservative and neoliberal governments, it is important to keep the hierarchy between men and women who uh, are um, who have been um, always reminded that uh, their traditional place is at home, at family, and taking care of the family. So uh, in this sense, also the attacks, the, um, for example, the uh, reasons why these countries, Turkey included, attack Istanbul Convention, because they say that um, Istanbul Convention um, promotes um, homosexuality against um, young people, uh, and it's... Um, it makes uh, take um, like distances from wedding and uh, like family values, and we know that this this kind of rhetorics are at the base on the um, on the bringing back that um, traditional um, social reproduction, which is which has to be carried out 
uh, by women according how they um, think, of course. We're not thinking like this. Um, at the same time, um, the attack uh, against Istanbul Convention is uh, symbolically very important also because it um, prevents um, the uh, possibility uh, for women or LGBTQI people who escape from um, violent places or from uh, male violence that they may uh, face in their um, countries. Uh, in, the, in the countries where there is not going to be an Istanbul uh, convention, it is not going to be possible to apply as a political um, asylum uh, seeker in order to to re, uh, make recognize the um, male violence against women and LGBTQI people as a political fact. So this is very important as well because this um, in the in the we know that in the central uh, and, and eastern and central European countries, some of um, governments uh, they try to block uh, the arrival of um, migrants and asylum seekers, and the lack of the Istanbul Convention in these countries is a is a, um, a major um, instrument for them to block these arrivals. So uh, actually the attacks against Istanbul Convention really um, includes uh, very different uh, aspects uh, that um, that are really um, problematic for uh, women, migrant women and LGBTQI people. Yes, I find it so um, that that this conservative backlash it always it seems to always be working together against, against women, against recognizing gender as being anything else but what they deem it is as just natural and given, and and then of course this comes with a narrative that is profoundly heterosexual and based on traditional family values. It's all. It all seems back together in, in Poland as well with the attack on LGBT people and uh, the um, attack on women uh, regarding their abortion rights. So this, these things always seem to come a bit together. And then, of course, the, the response and the resistance, I think it, it's like having uh, these, all these allies that come from, from different movements, like feminist movements, right, Mi migrant movements and uh, queer movement, I imagine. Yeah. Um... I think it's totally true that we we are witnessing sort of a conservative backlash, which is not limited to uh, Turkey or or Poland, uh, but these two cases are pretty uh, telling of uh, a dynamic, uh, which actually we can say that started also with the pandemic when with the um, the attempt to uh, bring back women into the houses and to criminalize LGBTQI people uh, because family needed to be uh, reasserted as the, the, the basic unit of, of social reproduction. Um, and I think it's no coincidence that the attack on uh, abortion rights, abortion freedom in Poland uh, was then followed by this uh, new alternative convention called uh, Yes to Family, Not to Gender. So it's pretty uh, amazing how uh, it is kind of foreseeable uh, that the, the bad response of Polish institutions uh, against the pandemic was paralleled by uh, an attempt just to attack women and LGBTQ people, of course. Uh, but this is a war, like I would define it a war against women, uh, which has been uh, waged not just by uh, this fascist government, or, uh, but also by neoliberal governments in, in, all, uh, in the whole Europe. Um, for, uh, for instance, uh, in, in Italy, we are having, uh, well, of course, there is a, a plan for a reconstruction, uh, which follows the European guidelines. And we are uh, waiting a bit to see what, what will uh, how it will be developed in the next month, but it doesn't look good for sure. But before the, the reconstruction plans or the recovery plans, uh, there was is a family act. So very, <laughs> the, the, also the name is very significant, which is a reform of uh, child allowances. Uh, 
uh, which basically uh, excludes uh, women from, um, uh, so it, it excludes um, uh, migrant women without a long-term residence permit from these allowances. And also it's, um, it basically reproduces the idea that there are second class workers and earners who are women and uh, whose uh, wage is just accessory and they can be paid less and they can actually uh, yeah, get money just to stay at home because it's their place. And they will get a very, uh, very small amount of money in order that if they still want to go to work outside of the house, they will pay a, a babysitter or a care worker uh, for a, a wage which is uh, uh, less than the, the minimum of the minimums. Um, so it's basically a chain uh, of uh, uh, exploitation that uh, runs uh, thanks to from, from women to women, thanks to these uh, reform of uh, welfare measures, uh, specifically concerning uh, child allowances. Um, another thing that it, it does is the, it basically this uh, reform, this family act, uh, puts together all the different child allowances that uh, or uh, subsidies to women workers that uh, were uh, existing before. And now there is uh, only one uh, state aid for, for women and mothers. And it, it is basically a bureaucratic way to uh, to restrict uh, uh, this to to reduce the the size of these aids and to exclude more and more women from uh, these uh, these funds. So it's basically another uh, yeah uh, another proof that uh, th this counterattack on women who have been dismantling the family, who have been moving within uh, across the borders and have basically undermined. The institution of the family. Now, these governments, who are not just the, the fascist ones or the Catholic ones or the Islamic ones, etc., but all, uh, but different uh, countries in different measures, have been uh, uh, responding to what women have basically destroyed in these years. That is the the marriage and the idea of of the family and uh, uh, unpaid labor performed by them. Um, just to say. Uh, that I think it is not just an institutional um, level of, of attack, of patriarchal attack, but in, in the increase of domestic violence and violence on LGBTQI people, we can also see how this has uh, permeated the whole society. Therefore, we need to, to have a double like uh, level of, of action to counteract uh, these institutional measures, but also uh, with our struggle to uh, fight against uh, hierarchies and uh, patriarchy and institutional racism, which acts on, on every level of this uh, neoliberal society. Yes, I, I feel like it's been a really long, it's been a really long history and a really long um, time in which uh, these sort of powers have been building upon each other, like capitalism, on patriarchy, on racism, and sort of excluding others, finding certain others that can be exploited in different ways and paid less if they are paid. And well, feminist movements um, have obviously been doing a lot of work in the last years, but then again, uh, I just like the whole problem of migration, what has been happening, basically, I, I feel like in some countries, uh, some women got to be a little bit free, freer because of the work of other women, other migrant women, right? So this is how do we disentangle all of this, all of this process. And maybe just, maybe if if one of you could, could talk a bit more exactly about how and why are women always relegated to this work of social reproduction? Maybe Sofo, if you want. <laughs> where, do, where do we start? <laughs> um, so, you know, division of gender, division of labor has been around for a long time. I think under capitalism, you know, it has taken on a certain role uh, because of, you know, family and home life and work life has been divided and um through a process if you i don't know if we want to go really too far in advance in, in back is like you know there was there was struggle and there were strikes and there was demands for better wages and at the end of the day uh women's um, demands were 
more or less pushed into the family wage. And the family wage sort of made it that women would stay home while the men would have enough money, one wage that would support a family. Um, and so since then, capitalism, since the golden age of capitalism mostly has been over, right? With the rise of neoliberalism all around um, the world and with the breakdown of the Soviet Union that's created a very right-wing spaces of like sort of post-communist world is, is very, very right-wing. A lot of exp uh, right-wing experiments are sort of coming from there, um, is unable to keep up the family wage and therefore needs um, the family wage supported social reproduction. Social reproduction just pretty much basically means um, if you look at a human like a product right to make a product you need you need materials and you need people you know you people who make them workers and so uh to have a person that's somewhat stable and able to function and work on you know be sold on the marketplace um has to be you know has certain level of education has to have certain amount of health um, and has to be sort of emotionally somewhat stable, right? So they don't just sort of kill people. And then you need the, and who does this work? It's it's mostly women. And before it was at least um, the material part, right? The home and so on, at least we're being paid by this sort of family wage, but because that's in decline, um, sort of social reproduction or the reproduction of, of humans you know, under capitalism is in like severe jeopardy. Um, and in this, the poor countries like post-communist countries are, or, you know, or like Latin America and so on are being relegated to being sort of social reproduction spheres where the family wage is being declined in Europe. They're bringing in uh, and social services. So families, i oh, sorry, family wage and so also concessions of social services that would help the sort of reproduction, the, the unproductive part about life, right? because you don't make money when you're at home. And so, um, like mostly, you know, women from say Georgia are being sent, you know, they're migrants, um, very cheap labor force, say in Italy, where they're providing services that, uh, that locals would charge much higher for because they have higher wages because of higher living. And they're assuming the migrants are going to live like five to 10 people, you know, a room. Um, they're going to uh, suffer, suffer because they have no rights that they use uh, like legalization, like paperwork as a way to make them make sure they don't actually ever uh, ask for better working conditions. So their wages never really rise. And what's happening is that social reproduction, as in these women have kids here, who's raising the kids here? It's it's the men aren't doing it really. And there's almost no social services here. So it's created a huge crisis where it's, I don't know, it's a, it's a sort of a catastrophe. You know, people are not able, they're not emotionally balanced, right? They don't have their needs met. They haven't seen their mother in 15 years. And, and, and there's been like, you know, examples of suicide and, um, you know, problems like high drug use because of it. Um, and so social reproduction in general has been relegated to women or migrant women um, because of the way capitalism has been structured and how it has changed the last uh, 30, 40 years because of the sort of decline of the golden age of capitalism, where there was a, so more of a welfare and Soviet Union existed, where uh, things were sort of more stable, period. I don't know if I explained too much, but <laughs> that's, that's the short version, I think. No, no, it's it's not too much. It's um, it's good. It's it making it's making me think. Actually, in Romania, there's there's also exactly the same the same issue with uh, parents leaving, especially women, and children are are left to fend for themselves, or sometimes with grandmothers or grandparents, because sometimes somebody still needs to to take care of them. But obviously, these women are most often doing care work or domestic work or other sorts of, of care work for somebody else's children. Can I add something to what Sopo said? Yeah, of course. 
Um, I think, um, you know, um, now, like, we have this problem, uh, as you asked, why, like, mostly women are conducting the social reproduction work. And um, at a general level, for example, uh, it is very important, I think, to talk about also how um, this structure is kept alive. Like, what are the instruments that are, are have been used by um, governments uh, in collaboration with the uh, bosses uh, in order to make a bigger profit. For example, um, we know that in the European Union countries, but not only also, for example, outside of the uh, European Union, for instance, also in Turkey, there are a lot of Syrian refugees and migrants and asylum seekers. So also there, even if Turkey doesn't make part of the uh, European Union, also there is this kind of structure where um, like all like migrants, asylum seekers and stuff, they need to have a residence permit in order to stay uh, at, the, at the new country that they are staying. So, for example, in Europe, in order to have a residence permit or renew it, uh, one needs to have, um, not, needs to uh, meet some requirements. And these requirements, for instance, are directly related to a work contract and a... Um, a salary or at the family. So all these three points are directly um, also are those uh, points that they lay also at the bottom of the uh, patriarchal system and also the male uh, violence against women. Let me explain um, more what I want to say. For example, in um, Europe, uh, in order to have a residence permit, once need to uh, especially find a job with a with a job contract, and they uh, also need to have a salary. There is an amount of salary uh, salary um, re required uh, by the governments. So if one if one um, earns under that uh, amount, uh, even this person has a job, it, it is not um, enough to get the renewal of residence permits. So what does that mean? This means that also, like, uh, we, we, we have been living uh, like an economic crisis since 2008, and but now with the pandemic, it even became bigger. So now it is, uh, for, for migrant people, it has always been very difficult to find jobs, but in this period, it is something um, almost impossible. So that means that in order to get a residence permit, so in order to um, continue to stay in the uh, country where they are, they end up um, accepting really the, the like uh, the works that are like uh, are paid as like starvation wages or like um, jobs works at workplaces where they are treated uh, as uh, almost like um, you know um, uh, non-humans that they, they live and work in non-human conditions but this is this became this becomes possible because uh, the migrants and another asylum seekers need to um, show uh, that they have a job contract and they they, they have that amount of um, salary which can permit these people to renew or to obtain their residence permit. Or at the same time, there is another uh, way uh, to obtain a residence permit or to renew it. It is the family reunification. In the family reunification, the most of the uh, people who ask uh, this family reunification residence permit are women. And of course, that means that women who ask um, this kind of uh, residence permit are, um, are, are dependent on the salaries and on the uh, residence permit or citizenship of their uh, partners. And when uh, these uh, male partners, uh, in case they become, they result uh, violent, of course, uh, these women uh, need to think twice in order to uh, finish this relationship or to end this relationship or denounce uh, 
uh, this relationship to uh, authorities in order to get protection protection uh, protection because uh, when uh, this relationship upon which the residence permit um, is dependent finishes that means that these women stay without a uh, residence permit. This is also a very important why Istanbul Convention is important in this sense, because Istanbul Convention also uh, recognizes violence as a political act. So um, as we see, like as East, in in uh, in east there are also some of our um comments that they they make part of like also myself i make part of transnational migrants coordination is like one of our biggest claims is uh, to have a unlimited and unconditional residence permit for all people in europe so because if we can like cancel this uh, residence permit regime then we can be free from all these um, three points of the work contract that uh, and a certain amount of salary and uh, the re family reunification that um, puts us in like cages and limit our freedoms. Thank you. Thank you, Orkida. That's so important what you're saying. And it's, uh, it's especially, it made me realize that I actually want to ask another question. Uh, because I haven't been paying, uh, I don't think I've been paying enough attention. I was thinking of the EU and uh, I was thinking of how um, people who migrate within the EU um, don't, don't have that many uh, problem, legal problems. So I wanted to ask you, what is the flow of migrants in, in Europe and how, who is affected by the, the resident permit problem? Actually, uh, of course, uh, the residence permit, like uh, people who come uh, from outside of the EU uh, has to ask a residence permit. Of course, people uh, who come to, um, like, for example, let's make the example of Italy, like, of course, uh, some people uh, who come from Poland, of course, they don't need to ask a residence permit. But what is the problem is this uh, residence permit doesn't affect only uh, migrants people's life but it affects uh, to um the all people, also the people, non-migrant people life, because this residence permit regime is um, very useful for governments and like for uh, neoliberalists to keep down uh, the salaries of all the people. Because when in a society you have some people who have to accept no matter what, all these um, in these humane conditions and starvation wages in order to guarantee their residence permit in the in the society you uh, create automatically a, a hierarchy that means that there are some people who have to unfortunately accept uh, these starvation wages uh, in order to guarantee their stay in this in the Europe. So that means that also in the society you have this ch like cheap um, labor, which affect also people who who, who don't need to uh, ask residence permit. But where they live, uh, some people uh, can uh, prefer prefer to. Um, hire uh, some migrant people who they can give starvation wages than then people who don't who don't not who don't need uh, to ask residence permit but in this sense in this in this uh, society that we live this um the salaries and wages uh, stay very low so this affects everybody not only migrant people but of course at the um, concrete example in order to uh, stay in europe uh, who, migrant people who come outside of European Union, they need to ask for a residence permit. But that, that, that doesn't make that, um, of course, so it affects like all the society. So that's why we need to um, uh, struggle and fight all together, migrants and non-migrants, men and women all together. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's actually a, a great point. Um, it's a great point because I think it, it really shows how uh, an unequal distribution and uh, an unjust hierarchy hurts much uh, like more people than than initially uh, people could imagine. And I think it also shows that the alliances we can make can be like broader than, than initially thought. Can, can I add something on this? Yeah. Um, 
I think that uh, it is super relevant that also um, to understand how institutional racism works also uh, in other ways, which is not uh, the, the residence permit, which of course uh, affects the lives of, of a million uh, workers, people in, in Europe. Um, but there are other ways to ensure that the mobility is governed according to the needs of capital. And uh, uh, probably you can remember uh, these pictures of these uh, uh, workers in Romania or uh, in Bulgaria waiting for uh, flights to go to Italy to work in the fields or uh, to go to Austria and work as uh, care workers, living care workers, domestic workers or, or healthcare workers. Uh, because also internal migrants uh, within the, the EU are uh, a structural uh, workforce. They, they cannot be uh, put apart, aside, because they are fundamental for uh, the survival of whole societies. Uh, and, and so we, we see very different ways in which uh, migrants, even the internal migrants, are exploited uh, and uh, uh, subjected to racism. Uh, for instance, uh, there are these recruitment agencies, uh, which often work um, together with governments in order to uh, bring some uh, to import some workforce for from uh, yeah these uh, central and eastern European countries in other uh, Western countries and uh, they impose a certain level of uh, salary and uh, sometimes they uh, they withdraw the passports of the workers so that they cannot leave or uh, they they use very different ways to tie uh, the workers to the workplace or the boss. Uh, so that even though these workers are fundamentally, they do, don't need any uh, residence permits, but they are subjected to the same kind of mechanisms. Or if we think about posted workers, uh, these workers are maybe, uh, they, they are from Poland, but uh, the, let's say their boss is based in Hungary, so, or, in, or even outside of the EU, in uh, Ukraine, for instance. Therefore, they follow the rules and they get the wages of uh, the, the boss of the country, uh, which can have also very, very low salaries. So even though they are employed on the European uh, territory, they follow the rules uh, the, the, the way and they get the wages of uh, another a third country because EU allows in very different ways workers, uh, sorry, the bosses to exploit migrant workforce in very different ways. Uh, there is also, um, yeah, I was mentioning seasonal mo mobility or temporary uh, mobilities. And maybe you can remember uh, the revolts, uh, yeah, the upheavals that happened in Mondragone, uh, close to Naples in southern Italy, where some um, migrant workers from Bulgaria uh, were uh, in a clash with the local populations because basically uh, they couldn't respect the, the curfew or uh, the restrictions for uh, COVID-19 because they, went, they had to go to work in the fields uh, because otherwise they couldn't get any, any wage and they were just starving because they don't have any net of protection from the Italian state, neither from the Bulgarian one. So they are extremely um, uh, under the blackmail even though they are uh, not subjected to the residence permit, still institutional racism make them live in uh, crammed uh, dorms or uh, reception centers or whatever, uh, or uh, in, in these uh, lodgements for migrant workers, because they, they, the bosses know that even though they aren't from outside of the EU, they can be treated exactly like external migrants. Um, so I think that uh, it's very relevant to unveil all the ways in which institutional racism works as a way to stratify, to divide um, workers, and, and, and also how uh, yeah, we can imagine some tools to struggle together. Because sometimes, and, and here comes again the, the problem of transnational strike, because even though um, maybe we, we, we have bosses not employing migrant workforce, there is still the threat to move uh, the factory, to move 
the plant or the service provider somewhere outside of the EU borders or even within the EU in some special economic zones. So uh, the, uh, the fact that capital can move and plants can move means that workers are under uh, a blackmail. Uh, so if you stop working or if you go on strike, if you demand higher wages or better working conditions or safety uh, regulations and protections, then we will just close the plants and we will move it somewhere else in Eastern Europe or in Czech Republic or in Georgia or whatever. So I think this is really important to, uh, to see how uh, different levels uh, are intermingling together and, uh, and, and maybe start from this to understand how we can really being effective in our uh, political action on, on the transitional level. Thank you, Eleonora. That's very uh, another uh, lots of many good points actually. And I I was thinking while you were saying I was thinking that the East Manifesto asks for um, these resident permits to be for all migrants and refugees and also for well-funded transnational welfare. So, what would that look like? I I don't know if, uh, the exact um, what what was concretely thought of in general, but I think like. Uh, you know, social services like welfare are very much limited to mostly it's like a citizens or certain kind of residence permits or so on. And they're linked to that. Or like in Georgia, it is very meager. So there's um, almost, there's no minimum wage. There's no unemployment insurance um, and so on. There's like almost, almost nothing, very basic a uh, welfare program if you're like very very poor you get like just enough not to die and the pension is also very very low and we should also think about pensioners we don't really talk a lot about but pension you know it's just a continuation of wages right when you can't work and that's also under attack um and so when we think of in those terms how much even just workers like since you know being a union leader organizing strikes, organizing workers becomes much more difficult when they're, if they've ever been laid off or fired because of this, there's no unemployment insurance, right? There is no minimum wage. You can't control it. So you can't coordinate. You can't tell people, say like a nurse who's working, you know, three jobs just to make ends meet. She's making, maybe working 80 hours, 90 hours, maybe a hundred a week. So if you try to limit her hours, if there's no minimum wage, all they do is just, she's just going to get even less money, you know, and not some kind of minimum. And so all of these things make put workers in a very weak position to fight. As in the risk to strike, the risk to go against your boss becomes a lot higher without any kind of social security any kind of mutual aid and all those things that don't, when they don't exist or strike fund, right? Another one is the strike fund is supposed to continue paying wages in some form while you're on strike, not having that either. So they in every way make it very risky as in like a high cost to go ever against the employer. And those are things that in my, the way I, I think of it is how do we, how do we minimize, how do we fight back and, and have programs, right? that are well-funded that are inclusive or right? universal that would give strength to workers to then be able to take more risks, or let's say it will be less costly for them to fight their employer. And this is really the, the crux of the problem is they on purpose limit these things. So to, to make you weak, right. To, to make you feel like, Oh, I must work for this sweatshop to survive. I must work for very low wages um, where I'm being abused. And I'm also then illegal or I will be deported, or I will not have uh, any money coming in, or I will never be able to get welfare from it. And so that would be one of my um, way I would see that. Yeah, um, sorry, just to add a very quick thing. I think that another uh, point that was made when we were discussing within IST about this claim of welfare is that uh, now many uh, states are having a welfare which basically reproduce uh, 
patriarchal order. So basically they are uh, confirming women in their uh, natural, allegedly natural uh, role as uh, caregivers. And so all the state aids where they actually exist are uh, thought, uh, are con conceived as ways to uh, reproduce the fact that women are performing care work for free or for very, uh, very low wages. Uh, so I think that uh, to claim a transnational welfare would be to dismantle those sorts of uh, transnational chains of uh, uh, exploitation, we, which also are based on the fact that uh, uh, welfare states in Western societies are uh, working just thanks to uh, the work of women and, uh, and of migrants. Uh, and in order to uh, yeah, just to make another example, uh, I think that what uh, uh, what we have been witnessing with the protests of uh, nurses in Bulgaria, for instance, um, but also in, in Georgia with doctors, etc., is that uh, they were contesting the fact that uh, welfare uh, should be something very uh, either expensive for those who can afford it or totally uh, degraded degraded. Uh, and in this uh, degraded public system, uh, women and uh, uh, migrants are working for very low wages without any protections and uh, constantly we under the risk of uh, uh, catching COVID-19 because they are having, as Sopo said, said before, they are having three jobs in a row and so they are basically passing the virus from one place to another because they don't have Hands, uh, hand sanitizers, uh, masks, and all these sort of things. And one of the things uh, that we wanted to, to say when uh, we were claiming for uh, welfare uh, on the transnational level is that it is a problem that involves both the workers and the users. Uh, so uh, defunded and degraded welfare or uh, non-existing welfare is not just a problem for uh, those who are not receiving any aids or healthcare uh, or education as well, but it's also a problem for those who work in those systems because they are overworked, lowly paid, uh, so on and so forth. So I think that uh, this is something we can can be a terrain of struggle even more in the next months because the the next generation EU. Uh, is going to uh, give a lot of money to many European countries um, and so will affect also how welfare is structured. Uh, so we will see what will happen in the next month, but I think that many things uh, will happen and we will need to, uh, to be very attentive. Uh, may also, I forgot to add, um, so one of the functions that the, the country of Georgia, the government, has taken on is to find legal jobs or legalize um, Georgian workers in Europe. So they mostly go to different countries and negotiate with them to say like legalize 10,000 of Georgians here, you know, 20,000 here. And then another function is also to find these kind of like fruit picking jobs and then tell everyone in Georgia to register for them. So that's like one thing that's been actually interesting to see that one of the functions of the government is to find jobs or legalize Georgians abroad and not actually to create jobs here. That's, I, I really didn't know that. Orkita, did you want to, to add? Just, just a little example. I think what uh, Eleanor said was really interesting and just uh, there is just like concrete example. I think it can uh, help further to understand better. For example, when these kind of welfare um, actions uh, try to uh, put women at their um, traditional place, uh, according to them, at houses and as like caregivers and who conduct the social reproduction. And it is very... Um, uh, like ridiculous how when when these uh, kind of um, aids uh, cannot put those women in their place they uh, e even though um, even if they cannot put those women in their places in some cases but then they um, make 
um, for, for example, just an example, there, in Italy, there's just like the babysitter bonus. And it is very ridiculous because um, the, the, it is a really a small amount of money, which um, of course um, make women who uh, work outside ha have to hire uh, my, like other women because it let, we all know that like the most of the uh, babysitters are women uh, or migrant women so they make them uh, pay really uh, ridiculous wages per hour like for let's say five euros per hour and they so they create it's still a, a hierarchy of wages, and in this case, also between uh, women and migrant women, but also between um, labor and migrant labor. So, in in any case, they try if if they cannot do something, uh, for example, with women, they at the end they they make it with migrant women. So. It, so this is very important to keep in mind when we all unite and like uh, fight against this kind of uh, also uh, at, at transnational level. We need to keep this in mind. That's a really good point. Yes, I think I think it really is, and it also it makes me think about um, how the work of social reproduction relates to the work of production for capital. How some of it is paid. And certainly a lot of it is unpaid, right? The, the whole domestic work that most often women do. And that has been, I think, an even, an even bigger problem now in the pandemic when so many people, um, well, women who, who had maybe sometimes these are considered better jobs, like office jobs, had to now work from home. Uh, but they also had to do all the domestic work at the same time somehow. Yeah, I think um, this is very important for East, uh, as we also wanted to bring together struggles in production and social reproduction. Uh, and also, we uh, one of our claims is uh, higher wages for all. Uh, so it means that uh, we we said it because we want to subvert this uh, uh, this society which works in the patriarchal neoliberal racist ways. Uh, and in order to do so. We need to disrupt uh, both production and social reproduction. And this is something uh, that uh, was a very powerful message uh, we learned in a way from uh, the global women's strike. Uh, but this is not just because women are employed both in productive and reproductive labor, but because feminism, for, uh, for me at least, but I think also for East, is a way to show that a specific condition uh, regards all because of the oppression of, of women and uh, is a way to enforce also social and racist hierarchies that serve to guarantee exploitation. And this also links to the fact that, as we said before, families should be uh, uh, legitimized as a social institution. And therefore, we also see the criminalization of LGBTQI people who are uh, very uh, the symbol, let's say, of sexual freedom uh, which we are also fighting for. Uh, so I think that uh, if we want to subvert this society that is functioning this way, uh, we also need to fight against the basic blackmail that ties uh, millions, billions of people uh, in the world, which is the blackmail of the wage. Um, they are supposed to go, and we are supposed to go, every day to work to make someone else rich. Uh, so I think that uh, low wages are a, an instrument to reinforce uh, this uh, exploitation uh, that uh, in, in different ways affects, uh, affects uh, the, let's say, the 99% of the population. Um, and so in this regard, uh, I wanted to mention the European Directive on Minimum Wages, because I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, how it works. Uh, of course, it is not uh, um, a, a very effective uh, way to uh, block exploitation since uh, it is not um, working on a European level, but uh, the, the EU wants to say to each state that uh, the, average, the, the minimum wage shouldn't be below the 50% of the gross average wage or the 60% of the median average wage. 
So it's not really uh, disrupting the dynamic uh, according to which uh, some countries have very low wages and other countries have very high wages or um, yeah, high wages at least, higher wages. Uh, so it's not really dismantling that how uh, the tr transnational chains of production work, uh, but still it is telling the fact that many countries in Eastern Europe are opposing this European directive because they uh, think they will lose the advantage to have a cheap workforce. And so they will lose that the advantage of having um, uh, plants or firms moving to special economic zones or uh, Eastern and Central European countries. Uh, so they will lose the uh, foreign direct investment. So also uh, it's not just, uh, it's also telling how capital works on the transnational levels. It works uh, thanks to these differences in wages. Uh, and therefore, I think it is not enough for us to claim uh, uh, the, the, the end of gender pay gap according to which women get less money than men. Uh, of course, it is something that uh, needs to be addressed, but I think that uh, it is more important to claim higher wages for all and at least uh, equal wages on the European level and also beyond in order to dismantle, to fight, to contest that mechanism uh, that allows uh, bosses to make money and to uh, benefits of wage differences across the European and transnational space. Thank you, Eleonora. That's such a good point. I was just, I remember the fact that I read somewhere there's all this whole discussion in Romania regarding the fact that Romania does not have such a big gender pay gap in uh, relation to other countries of Europe. And everybody was like, wow, that's so good of Romania. And then somebody said, yes, but Let's look at why. And, and the reason why it was they said that because in Romania, so many people are on minimum wage. So everybody, well, not everybody, but since so many people are on minimum wage, there is not the same difference in the gender pay gap. So, of course, higher wages for all is, is definitely important, especially because the minimum wage uh, is often so low like in, in Romania it's very low. It's not enough to it's not really enough to, to properly survive on especially if you have to pay rent. Um, yeah, the same, same here. The pay, gender pay gap may not be very di different, even though according to some statistics it is, because everybody makes such low pay. Uh, so maybe just to, um, to wrap up um, our conversation, um, I was thinking about how um, we, were, we were first talking about the transnational strike and the manifesto for the um, 8th of March, and now uh, the 1st of May is approaching. So I wanted to ask if you're planning anything for the 1st of May and onwards. Uh, yeah, uh, we are actually uh, joining the, the call for a transnational day of migrant struggles and strike. Uh, launched by Transnational Migrants Coordination, as we also said at the beginning of this uh, uh, very nice conversation today. Uh, we uh, wanted to respond to this call on the 1st of May to say that uh, we will, of course, uh, take to the streets and uh, be in the squares on the 1st of May uh, because it's May Day, Workers' Day. But this year, uh, we also want to bring in the voice of migrants uh, especially migrant women, of course, but migrants in, in general, uh, because we think that it, it is important to, to bridge the struggles and to show that uh, there can't be any struggle against exploitation or for uh, claiming the force, the, the global force of uh, the, the workers uh, everywhere in the world if we do not take into account the condition of migrants uh, which is not just related to the workplaces, but also about uh, the, the other uh, conditions that migrants experience in their everyday life. And uh, as we were saying before, uh, we want to connect uh, the struggles of those who leave and those who stay, uh, because we see that uh, both the, the condition of, of both subjects are very strictly interlinked because differences in education, welfare, 
uh, wages uh, are uh, um, a force that makes many people want to go abroad and look for a better life and better wages and sometimes also better welfare. But this is connected to uh, also the conditions of those who stay and need to face these very dire conditions um, in the houses and in the workplaces. So I think that the 1st of May could be also for East a moment where uh, we can experiment a connection uh, with uh, uh, in, in the name of uh, migrants uh, struggle and strike and also to reflect a bit uh, how we can empower uh, each other's struggles and how to connect them on the transnational level, uh, pushing forward a bit our process and uh, uh, see if we can fight not just on the day uh, of the 1st of May, but also uh, beyond and to relaunch our initiative uh, for the future. So uh, yeah, the, on the 1st of May, we will uh, be in the streets and uh, we also wrote a statement in support of uh, transnational migrants coordination. Uh, but basically, yeah, I think there it will be another occasion for East to uh, to to shout loud our uh, message against patriarchy, exploitation, and racism um, on the transnational level. Thank you. Also, I would like to add something that at the our uh, last assembly, like our uh, East last uh, public assembly that we organized, um, as we also said before, the participation was really high, and it, there were like really many women all, from all over the world. And uh, at the end of this assembly, um, um, beyond the first of May, we also we also talked about the um, organize a um, second uh, assembly on. 23rd of um, May uh, towards uh, for uh, or an organization as also um, stated by the comrades from Turkey uh, that they are still uh, resisting and organizing and fighting ag against the withdrawal uh, from uh, Istanbul Convention. So we're also uh, after the 1st of May, of course, we're not finishing our um, uh, activities or our event, political events, but we will be continuing with the with a, in collaboration with uh, comrades from Turkey in order to uh, keep alive the attention on the attacks and the withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention, and this is going to uh, this will continue. Thank you, Orkide. Sopo, do you have anything to to add to to end on? First, I just want to say thank you so much for having us on. Really appreciate this um, to you know get us to, to for you to get to know us a little bit better, and hopefully um, we can get stronger every year. And our next May Day will be even bigger and better than next than the one that we're going to have each year to go strong, get stronger. Great. Let's let's have it that way and. Um like struggle together until there is, you know, nothing left to struggle for, if ever. The Transnational Migrants Coordination calls everyone to express their rejection of the European regime of patriarchal racism and exploitation on May 1st by demonstrating and striking in the squares, streets, workplaces, around the borders to demand a permanent and unconditional European residence permit, dissociated from work, income and family. On the day when we traditionally celebrate the strength of workers, we want to create a common front and shout out that there will be no collective freedom as long as migrants' lives will be enchained by the blackmail of the residence permit. And as long as migrant women will be constrained in essential and bad paid jobs and exposed to violence. The exploitation of all workers cannot be broken as long as migrant workers remain isolated and affected by racism. The strength to overthrow this world must come from our collective practice of freedom and insubordination and our ability to organize transnationally. Thank you for listening to Contrasense. This episode was produced by Maria. This episode's guests were Eleonora, Orchide and Sopo. And uh, if you like the episode, don't forget to organize and strike. You can follow East's work and webinars on their Facebook page and read their articles on transnational-strike.info. Also, you can support us in spreading knowledge about activist movements and social sciences by donating to our Patreon. 
you'll find the link below. More about us on our Facebook page, you can listen to us on SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes and Spotify. We're also looking forward to your feedback or questions and culture sense at protonmail.com. Bye!